Good afternoon. Thank you. And welcome to the January series on this Martin Luther King Jr. Day. My name is Michael Arroy, and I am the president of Calvin College. I'm pleased to also give a special welcome today to the guests at three of our 52 remote webcast sites, Ripon, California, South Windsor, Connecticut, and St. Joseph, Michigan. Thank you for participating in this global discussion. Today, the longstanding Staub Lecture Series also coincides with the January series and with Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Today's address continues the Staub Lecture Series history of presentations exploring ethics, apologetics, and philosophical theology. Now, please join me in opening today's presentation with a word of prayer. Gracious God, this day we remember your servant, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We thank you for the example of this follower of Jesus who dreamed of a just and peaceable kingdom in our society. May his dream be our dream. As we remember Dr. King's work, we give thanks for it as an extension of your work to renew a broken world and bring about your kingdom. We pray that you may give us the strength to continue the work of truth-telling and justice-seeking in the name of love all year long. Thank you also for the work and the living example of our Calvin alumnus, Willie Jennings. Speak through him today and grant Christ followers everywhere an imagination and hope for our homes, our schools, our churches, and our communities. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And at this time, I welcome Jewel Maidenblick, my partner in ministry and president of Calvin Theological Seminary. He'll introduce today's speaker, Willie Jennings. In some settings, because of Calvin College and Calvin Seminary with the Calvin Prison Initiative, we also sometimes say partners in crime, but not always. Grateful today, once again, for this continuation of a history between Calvin College and Calvin Seminary to present the Staub Lecture. The Staub Lectures are named after and in honor of Dr. Henry Staub, who served so well as a professor at both institutions. Dr. Staub served from 1939 until 1975, except for those years when he served in the armed forces as a lieutenant in the United States Navy during World War II. The Staub Lecture is funded by the Henry Staub Endowment. We again, again express our appreciation to the family of Dr. Staub for their continued support and encouragement for these lectures, as noted once again in terms of Dr. Staub's contribution to the church and the kingdom of God. As I am privileged now to introduce our speaker for today, Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings, many of you know him well. He's a person who on this day, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, helps us to continue to have biblical dreams, as well as recognize the reality of sin and brokenness in our lives, especially in the area of race. Dr. Jennings is a storyteller, who's also a poet, a preacher, professor, and prophet. He served as professor at Duke University Divinity School from 1990 until 2015, who in 2015 joined the faculty of Yale University as Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies. He's the author of The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, which won the American Academy of Religion Award of Excellence in the Study of Religion in 2010, and in 2015 also the Graymeyer Award of Religion. Jennings is also the author of a popular commentary on the Book of Acts, entitled Acts of Commentary, The Revolution of the Intimate. Reverend Dr. Jennings is an ordained Baptist minister who is in high demand as a speaker and is widely recognized as a major figure in, the theolo in theological education across North America. When he comes to Calvin, it always is a form of homecoming. He's a 1984 Calvin College graduate who then on went to receive his MDiv degree from Fuller Theological Seminary and his PhD in Religion and Ethics from Duke. 
He also received the Calvin Distinguished Alumni Award in 2017. In addition to these professional accomplishments, he is the husband of Joanne and the father of two daughters. As is customary, our speaker will be available to greet the audience in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following the presentation and his books will be for sale there. Kelvin College and Kelvin Seminary are grateful to the Stab Lecture Series for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome home, Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings. Good afternoon. It is a high honor for me to be here with you. I'm so thankful for that wonderful introduction and for the honor of being the Stop Lecturer for this year and also speaking at the wonderful January series. I have looked forward to this since the invitation came a while back. I bring you, my friends, warmest greetings from Dean Greg Sterling, the faculty and the staff of Yale University Divinity School, well, where we endeavor every day, not just to understand the world, not just to interpret the world, but we want to change it. And so I am so glad to be a part of that faculty and so glad to be here with you on this wonderful day. In, in cold Grand Rapids, I, <laughs> I love the cold. I, I was telling a group of students earlier today that I spent a few years uh, when I was in seminary living in Southern California where it was 70 degrees and warm and sunny every day and I hated it. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> I, I, missed, I missed the four seasons, the, you know, the short, intense Michigan summer and then the beautiful fall and then the, the heart-pounding, embracing winter, <laughs> and then again the spring that turns to summer. You know, those four seasons are so important, and I am so glad to now be living in the part of the country where, um, in Connecticut, where I get the four seasons again. So those of you who have not learned to love gray skies and snow, I'll be praying for you that God will allow you the blessing of learning the beauty of that. I, I grew up here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I left here as soon as I possibly could. <laughs> I attended this wonderful institution, Calvin College. They didn't know it, and I didn't know it at the time but Calvin was part of my own personal underground railroad. It was a holding station until I could map out my next steps to freedom. As a young man, I did not know why I wanted to get out of Grand Rapids so badly. I only sensed that my questions about this place, this town, were too big to be answered while I was in it. I have been back and forth to Grand Rapids many times since I moved away, but this past summer I did something that reminded me of not only why I moved away, but also of some of the crucial questions that have shaped my life, haunted my life in racial America. This summer, I taught a short course on race and geography for the Institute of Christian Worship here. And as part of that course, we did what I call a racial geography tour. I wanted this group of pastors, church leaders, community leaders, leaders of parachurch organizations to see the ways race functions geographically on the ground in a city. So we drove through my old neighborhood on Franklin Street, following some of the routes I took on my Stingray bike as a boy. <laughs> we drove down to Division Street, up on Hall, over on Burton. We drove all around my old haunts 
that I traveled as a boy during those beautiful, short, intense summers that mark life in Western Michigan. We drove from Grand Rapids, Central City, if you will, to East Grand Rapids. Those of you who don't know the geography, don't worry about it, just follow this, follow this. We drove from neighborhoods strangled by landlords and money neglect to neighborhoods that have never known a moment of absent care with lawns that have been manicured for decades ever since I was a boy. We drove on Wealthy Street and saw the power of a slow gentrification. And I looked once again at the pitiful green spaces in the black and Hispanic communities that are nothing less than an insult to life. We, what we saw as we drove around was not a commentary on how people care for their property, but how place always plays in and with race. Place plays with race. Grand Rapids is no different from so much of racial America where geography and race shape the contours of how we live, how we think, and how we dream. And it is dreaming, it is dreaming that I want to talk to you about today. Dreaming. The kind of dreaming made possible by the land, by the ground. And the kind of dreaming that is made strange, made sick, by the way we inhabit the ground. My friends, the ground carries our wounds. It bears witness to the racial wounding that is America. And we have learned to dream our futures on the wounds. Every January, every January, many of us in this country turn our minds to remembering Martin Luther King Jr. and his dreaming for America, his marvelous dreaming. But what does it mean to dream on a wounded land and with a wounded earth? Dreaming on a wounded land has been part of life in the United States and the rest of the world formed by the Western world for a long time. From the moment those first Christian colonial settlers stepped onto soil that was new for them and heard sounds that were strange to them and saw people and animals and even landscapes that confused and frightened them, animals and peoples they had not imagined could even exist. Those early European Christians from the 16th century forward, standing in the new worlds of the Americas, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, the Pacific Islands, and so many other places, asked themselves an important question. Who am I in this new place? Who am I? in this new place? This was the right question, the holy and good question. You see, the newness of place should always provoke from us such a question. The problem came with the answer they gave themselves to that question. These early Europeans answered the question without voice or vision of the peoples of the new world. And in so doing, they self-designated. That was bad enough, but the horror continued as they designated vast numbers of remarkably different peoples. As they did this, they quickly began to suture together different peoples, clans, tribes, into racial categories. They these early Europeans, they were white. And the others, almost white. 
not quite white, non-white, or almost black, not quite black, or black. They also created a diseased world of designation. That's the way to put it. A diseased world of designation between white and black, capable of capturing all people in racial identities. These early European Christians also designated themselves owners. They believed that God had given them the new worlds for one central purpose, to bring the new worlds, the peoples, their ways of life, and of course the land, into maturity, mature use, mature production. Mature life. These Christian settlers believed that the indigenous peoples did not know what they had or what to do with what they had. So it was their God-given, God-ordained task to teach the indigenous peoples how to make proper use of the land and the animals. The taking of land. The taking of land was part was the beginning of our wounding. But the taking of land from so many peoples was only part of the wound. These Christian settlers also separated peoples from the land, believing that the land was not what so many indigenous people said it was. It was not, it was not alive, not speaking to them in chorus with the voices of their ancestors. The animals were not their kin, not their extended family. That way of thinking, they said to so many native peoples, that way of thinking was naive, primitive, even demonic for some of these settlers. The settlers told native peoples that one piece of land, one piece of land, is like another piece of land. And that is the key word for today, my friends. Pieces. Pieces. Their lands should be understood in pieces. It should be seen in fragmentable, sellable plots. The land should be seen as property on its way to becoming private. Property on its way to becoming private. We have made the world private. We have made the world private. And this is also our wounding. Trees and birds, dirt and water, deer and squirrel, beaver, landscapes, rivers, beaches, valleys. We have made the world private and a possession. That which the Christian settlers knew only belonged to God, only belonged to God. They made their possession. And then we followed them in making it our own possession. And we all in this auditorium, we all listening, we all in this part of the world, we have learned to dream the land. We have learned to dream the land from visions of possession. Indigenous peoples had a different idea of possession. Not possession of the land and the animals, but possession by the land and the animals. So much pivots on just those two words. We belong to the land and the animals, they said, before the land belongs to us. We live always, we live always being observed and judged 
judged by the land and the animals for how we live in a place. Now let me be clear, as I can see some nervousness in a few faces. Possession is not a bad word. Ownership is not a bad word. But when combined with private and woven inside race, it became something else, something that wounds us, cutting deep, painful lines through the earth and through our bodies, through the earth and through our bodies. The story of America, and and indeed most of the world formed by the Western world, is the story of land seizure and segregation. That is the master story. We live in a geographic and racial wound that we have never been able to comprehend fully or begin to address in any substantive way. And that is the devastating effects of private property and the spatial distribution of goods and services calibrated along racial lines. The spatial distribution of goods and services calibrated along racial lines lines. Race and private property gave birth to the modern wounding realities of segregation. What haunts me and what I want to haunt you today as a gift, (laughs) what haunts me is the way Christianity has been and continues to be complicit with that wounding. Christian faith and life continue to be driven by the geographic winds, the geographic wounds, excuse me, created by land developers, city planners, civil engineers, real estate agents, city government officials, and architects. We are, however, not simply passive spectators to the constant geographic cuttings and turnings of contemporary life. We have performed our faith right on top of these developments, often presenting them as natural and normal ways of forming life and living in the world, when in fact they have never been. They have never been natural or normal, ever. One powerful example of this in the United States was the history and the phenomena of sundown towns. Sundown towns were towns all across the U.S., mostly out of the South, all across the U.S., that from the beginning of the 1890s through the 1940s and up into the 1950s purposely removed or kept out of their towns African Americans, sometimes Jews and sometimes Asians. These were towns that aggressively sought to construct themselves as all white communities. These towns, many of them filled with people deeply Christian, constructed a geographic whiteness. A geographic whiteness that permeated the earth, the land, and all their surroundings. Now, in order to understand what I am saying, you must forget, friends, you must forget about whiteness as phenotype, as bodily characteristic, forget that, or even as a European heritage, and see it for what it is, a sick vision of maturity, a vision of maturity based on achieving mastery of this world, control of its land and resources, and a freedom to live unencumbered by anyone. Sound familiar? This sick vision of maturity allowed early Europeans to unleash into the world a form of judgment that evaluated all peoples by how well they mastered their worlds and controlled their lands. To become white, 
was to aim one's life, aim one's life at controlling one's world, at possessing one's land, and mastering one's environment. And we are yet caught up in the constant constructions of geographic whiteness. Race has always been a matter of geography, and whiteness always aims to structure itself geographically on the ground, in the shape of communities, cities, towns, rural and urban areas, neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, even building by building, always creating geographic whiteness. I continue to be amazed by people who have been raised in all white communities or communities where the presence of people of color were highly monitored and controlled and who see that habitation as a naturally occurring phenomenon, like a waterfall or a rock formation. Such places breed a profound learned ignorance that conceals its deformity, denying to those so formed within those places the truth, the truth, that their worlds were highly structured segregationist spaces enabled by genocide, market manipulations, city planning, the wishes and whims of developers, the actions of real estate brokers, and the police and the unrelenting will of whiteness to exist unencumbered by non-white peoples. My friends, we all wear our places on our bodies, soft or hard. Some wear the unease of being in places and spaces no longer governed by a geographic whiteness. I know people and so do many of you, who have never had any authority figure in their life other than someone white or someone so assimilated as to never show a difference that would shock anyone into a sense of a shared world. I see their unease at being outside that white geographic space and in a world that they cannot control and the desperate, desperate, often secret desire to return to that place or turn the world itself into that geographic whiteness. Some wear the resentment of being raised and sometimes yet living in places and spaces not governed by a geographic whiteness and having to live in places that suffer the outside. Suffer the outside, outside excellent public schools, outside community resources at your fingertips, libraries and swimming pools, outside police only present in good behavior, outside safely walking, talking, strolling in the evening breeze like God Almighty looking for Adam and Eve. I know people, and so do you, who cannot see the forest for the trees, who cannot see that they are driven by an often tacit, hidden agreement, tacit desire to create a geographic whiteness, aiming at a suburbia of the mind, if not in place, even in urban places that they see as filled with despair and violence. They work sometimes unwittingly, sometimes knowingly, toward a habitation that performs even more refined forms of segregation. You see, my friends, whiteness always comes to rest in space. If you get nothing else, get that. It always comes to rest in space. The maturity whiteness aims at always forms segregated spaces. It forms lives lived in parallel, whether separated by miles or inches. It constructs bordered life 
Life lived in separate endeavors of wish fulfillment. Some have argued, and strangely, even argue now, even argue now, that segregation is natural. When did we forget about the horror of segregation? People segregate, they announce, the folks who think it's natural. People segregate, they announce, they form separate people groups shaped in history, in land and animal, in seasons, in history, histories, both victim and villain. And in the contingencies of time, they draw together people to create a tentative coherence of identity out of the chaos of its fragmentation. There is no argument here. People do separate, se separate. And even if we wish to make a fine distinction between separation and segregation, as some scholars have done, that is yet beside the point. We must look at the history, the blood-stained grounds of segregation's work. Segregation itself is an ancient strategy for constructing the world the way the rich and powerful wish the world to be. And in our time, segregation has been more than a crucial strategy of control, containment, and exploitation. Segregation has also always been the precursor to genocide. Preparing the way to move from enclosure of a people to their strangulation. Capture them in space and kill them in time. Capture them in space and in time you can slowly kill them disrupt the ground, mess up their water, shut down the routes in and out, capture them in space, and kill them in time. Today, my friends, too many of us see segregation as a natural act, a benign act that some, sometimes is unavoidable, sometimes is even necessary. We segregate now because we believe in it. We segregate spatially in our cities, in our towns, our neighborhoods, and our buildings, and in so doing, we perpetrate in inequality, xenophobia, racism, and violence simply by how we form the space. We tell ourselves that people segregate according to their preferences and for their own good. The geography flows with the market, and neither. Excuse me. Neither has, <coughs> neither has mind <clears throat> or evil intent. <coughs> but that is a serious lie. We segregate culturally maintaining in both obvious and subtle ways our boundaries of language, of story and practice, homegrown wisdom, religion and history. We may live and interact with each other, but we maintain a psychic distance and a clear and palpable sense of the other as outsider. This is unfortunate, a missed opportunity. And we segregate in desperation, in fragments of time. <clears throat> we run from the feel and force of assimilation, of being minority drowning in majority, of being a person of color adrift in a sea of whiteness, of being the one lost in the many. We seek out our own to remind us who we are and help us push back against images and ideas that render us deficient, unworthy of respect, ugly, dangerous, primitive, exotic, backward, shameful, or hopeless. We seek solace in the company of our own people for whatever time we need to gather the fragments of unassimilated life 
and to clothe ourselves afresh for our troubled journeys into a hostile world. This, my friends, is a fact of survival, a badge of strength. But nonetheless, it is a tragedy. What is should not be. We have been taught to dream in segregation, dream toward segregation, and to dream toward the private and toward possession which means we don't know how to dream. We don't know how to dream on the land and with the land. The land is one. The land is connected. The land speaks. It speaks across rivers and valleys, mountains and streams. The land invites us to dream. But dreaming, but dreaming is a sacred duty. It is the womb of the kind of thinking that moves toward life. Dreaming is where our desires join the flesh of our lives, aiming toward embodiment in space and time. And we who are Christian, we know this. We know that at the heart of our salvation, right at the center of our life with God, is having our dream life restored to health and wholeness through the Holy Spirit. The disciples of Jesus are given dreams. We are given dreams, dreams poured all over us and in us, dreams from God that aim always at one central thing, the joining of people together, like the land, the people should be one. The joining is everything. We Christians have always struggled to catch up to a God-made flesh who would lead us in the dreaming. But way too many of us have given over our dreaming to those who should never be left alone with our dreams of life on the land. We've given our dreaming over to those who have no right to our dreams. Living comfortably in racial America means that you have settled into to ways communities are being formed. Homes are being built, boundaries are being constructed, borders are being drawn, streets are being laid. And with all this, my friends, with all this, the racial fabric of America is being constantly replenished. The racial antagonism of this country, the racial antagonism of this country is always nourished by geography by how we allow and support and even celebrate the relentless segregation hidden in plain sight by housing prices, zoning policies, and of course, policing practices. You see, it all comes back to the ground and the fight over land. Who has it, who controls it, and who wants it? Racial America dreams itself as racial America by how we maintain, shape, and reshape our living places. What is needed now is a different kind of dreaming, my friends. A kind of dreaming that presses us to do two things. First, are you listening? Good. First, to question the geography. Question the geography, to stop accepting passively the way the communities, the way the communities are formed, the way communities are, and involve ourselves deeply in the forming and reforming of communities, asking always first, not what is good for the market, but what is good for the living good for the living before what is good for the market. 
to press against the idea that what's good for the market is good for the living. Reversed that. What is good for people? That's the question. What is good for people? How can, how can things be changed or built or left alone that helps the ground sustain the people? How can we more deeply connect the people to the life-giving realities of the earth? And how might we care for the earth in the specifics of places that allow earth and animals to live? And secondly, we need to question habitation. We need to question habitation and ask ourselves, how should we live. The configuration of something called rule and something called urban did not fall out of the sky. They were created from the ground up and often aimed at a segregation that will not yield. We should ask how we structure our lives, form places so that we live toward each other, aiming at a constant sharing in life a sharing of burden and struggle, and not away from each other. How might we live toward each other? Not just in our heads or in our hearts, but on the ground. How might we live toward a common, a common that builds joy, a common that builds safety, a common that builds hope? I know, of course, that some would say to me, Dr. Denise, thank you so much for this lecture, but simply changing geographic arrangements will not change hearts or minds. It will not end the racial antagonism that is at the heart of this country. That might be true, but I don't believe it. And I doubt that many of you believe that as well because if you look around, if you open your eyes and look around carefully, you will see what you know, that we spend enormous energy in this country, enormous time, enormous creativity and resources sustaining the geographic arrangements that nurture our racial antagonism. Here is the truth that many of us know deeply. If we change, if we change the structures of our living, in time we will change the shape of our lives. That is the truth. This, my friends, is what some people fear most, a shape for their living that they can never control. But for Christians, this is our calling to live with the God and toward a living filled with people we did not know, we did not choose, but who we are destined to love. In order to do that, in order to do what I am suggesting, it takes courage, but more importantly, it takes a desire to dream the end of racial America on the ground. Thank you very much. Welcome back. I'm Karen Salpi from the English department. Um, you may write questions on paper, hold them up for ushers to pick up, or email or tweet them to me. We have one from a student already. If whiteness is the repeated act of conquering, controlling, and owning is not, in fact, based on skin color or ethnic heritage, can black people be white? Yes. Anybody can be white, or should I say, Anyone can be, and everyone is asked to aspire to be. Mm. Uh, another student has asked, how can we acknowledge and celebrate race beyond skin, col skin color? Uh, that is, how can we celebrate ethnic diversity without focusing on 
race as color being the... Great question. This question is often asked. <clears throat> there is a work of celebration that is in front of us. But the, that work of celebration begins by learning histories and knowing stories. This is one of the great challenges for Christians especially. We are supposed to be wonderful storytellers. We are supposed to be people who love story, the stories of those around us, because it's all about story. And the goal of loving story and knowing story is not simply to accumulate stories. It's to live with those who tell them and to be a part of their lives. As I like to say, the goal here is not that I know my story, cherish my story, love my story, and yet live in the journey that is my story. The goal is that you know my story, Cher learn my story, cherish my story, remember my story. Never take it from me, never steal it from me, but learn it, live in it with me, and together be schooled by it. And I do, will do the same for you. That's the kind of celebration we need. We need a, a, the kind of celebration that invites us not only to know, but also to treasure, not only to treasure, but be schooled together by our stories. The problem with labels like ethnicity, like culture, like race, these labels, we use them in the academy, we use them in the church, we use them in the communities, we use them uh, in popular culture as it's called. The problem with these labels is that they tend toward commodification. They tend toward turning people into things and aspects of their lives into things that we can have, control, and call our own to possessions. And my life is not a call to possession. It's a call to joining. So what we need is a different way of thinking about the important work of living together inside of our stories. I, I like that. Uh, I, uh, you had an essay in Christian Century in October um, that, that asked the provocative question, can, can white can people, people be, be saved? saved? And it's a, it's, it's a challenging article. And there were moments as I read the article that I thought, well, now this is your story, your version of the story. Are there competing versions of the narrative and making sense of that? And what you said to the students this morning was we need to become the storytellers in our family. That, that, that's a claiming of a kind of power. Um, I appreciate and recommend the essay. Um, but so speaking of telling mm -hmm. stories, mm -hmm. um, from another student, and actually several students, how do I respond to a friend who does not believe racism is still a thing today and believes people should just forgive and forget? How do we make space and insist on the necessity of telling, telling b stories from all angles? That's a great question. Um, the first thing I think we all want to understand is that when we talk about race, when we think about race, it's never just how we think it's always also how we feel. Race is a conversation that involves both always thinking and feeling. And so, it, without turning everyone into to junior therapists, the, the, the first thing to do when someone wants to say something like that is to ask them, how, how does that make you feel? What, what, what would it be accomplished if I agreed with you that racism really doesn't exist? And the answer, of course, would be, I, it would help me feel a lot better about what I see in front of me. And of course, you know, that's a good place to start the conversation. That's a really good place to start. <laughs> Here's a hard one. <laughs> Serious question, please be honest and blunt. Why are there so few non-whites here? What does this have to say about whites and blacks? Well, I think the January series does a good job of bringing as many people as possible to, to these events. So that's, that's a positive thing to be said. To be said. Well, listen, um, we live inside long histories of segregation. They are yet with us. They yet exert their force. As I said today, 
they exert their force structurally, geographically. They exert their force socially in the way in which we imagine our life together. They exert themselves in the practices we live. And so we're still inside those streams. So predominantly white spaces are a part of that stream. Um, I think the question is also asking, um, probably provocatively, why, given a setting like this, isn't it more diverse? And I think the answer to that is, this is a part of the ongoing struggle of all institutions to figure out how to be in their space, how to be in a place that's diverse. Um, everywhere I go, especially on college campuses, one of the things I often talk about with um, the officials of these schools is how are they, what kind of citizen are they in their community? So many colleges and universities have turned themselves into little bubbles um, where the entire reality of the student is captured inside that little bubble. And the community that surrounds the school in many places is very diverse. And in many places, the community that surrounds the school, they are the servants of the school. The school is like a little, is like a little castle with its servants around or a plantation with its servants around. And the tragedy for so many wonderful institutions, I'm not talking about Calvin, I'm just speaking in general. Um, <laughs> um, We're working the, 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 um, the challenge for so many institutions across the country is that while in the classroom they are, they are helping students think these radical thoughts, they are shaping students in these radical ways of approaching the world, but the environment itself is also teaching them something. The environment itself is teaching them that their most comfortable, pleasurable and normal experiences happen in environments like this. And so what often happens is that students graduate with all these radical ideas, and then when they come out into the world, they recreate the same conditions that they enjoyed so much in college or a university. And so they, as I said in my lecture, they, 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 they have a suburbia of the mind <laughs> that they create wherever they're going, whether they live in a city or they live in a suburb, or they live in a, in a country area, they're trying to recreate the same reality. Sometimes they just do it implicitly. And so the kinds of decisions that they make, the kinds of things that they involve themselves in or don't involve themselves in, they recreate the very conditions that surrounded the university or the college they went to. And in so doing, they undercut the very radical ideas that they've been taught in college. And point of privilege, Calvin is, is working actively to be more diverse and it has been in my years here every year more enriching, more lively, more interesting, yes, more yes. diverse. We're clearly not there yet, but we're coming along, and I will say that, that my life as a teacher here has been blessed every year by a, a growing diverse population of students. Um, oh, let me so, just say that, of yeah. course, I wasn't talking about Calvin, so what you was, was, He mentioned I was, that. Talking yeah. about many other but, institutions. So. But we were, yeah. Uh, lots of questions are coming in asking us for just very particular practical steps that uh. we can take. Um, tiny, easy things uh, to get our feet wet. Um, mm -hmm. You've told us first to listen to one another's stories. I think that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, other, other quick advice. Practical. Quick advice, very quick advice. I say this everywhere I go. In every town in this country, often by law, there are those monthly meetings of the city commissioners or city elders, city council people. There are those monthly meetings where they're often on the uh, public access television and when they scan the audience, there's nobody there. And there's a, there's a group of um, city leaders up front. And those meetings are some of the most important ethical and moral meetings that happen in a community. Because those meetings are where bus routes are decided, mm -hmm. where sidewalks will be put, 
where price points for houses will happen, where developers that have been talking in private to the mayor and others about what they're going to do, where they come in, into the facade of a public meeting and, and present their plans that have already been pre-approved. But the way, anyway, I'm, I should have said it that way. But th the point is, is that these meetings are incredibly important. And we, those of us who care about place, who care about space, who care about ending the racial antagonism of this country, those of us who are Christian, we ought to be at those meetings in massive numbers. We ought to be there and we ought to be pressing for different bus routes, for sidewalks, from, for different kinds of houses, for different uses of space other than thinking just about cars. We ought to be there, right? Every school, every college, every church ought to, at some point in time, take its members, take its students, take its uh, parishioners, if it's a mosque or a, uh, or a temple, take its adherents, take them downtown, and every town is supposed to have the city map that is supposed to lay out in some way the developments that, are, that have been approved, the neighborhoods that are going to be changed, the neighborhoods that are going to be built, and you ought to, you ought to see how your city functions. It's a terrible shame that so many Christians have no idea how space works. And those of us who are deeply committed to life in the church, it's crazy that we think that we can have a, a healthy vision of the church with no understanding of how space works. The church is actually in the world and the world is actually the ground. And you can't be the church in the world if you don't know how the ground works. And unfortunately, so many Christians don't. Uh, a student asks, I, or comments, I notice a parallel with living on the earth as a part of the environment as opposed to controlling the environment with your call to question our geography. Both assume that the earth is a living thing and we are a part of it. Do you agree? Absolutely. This is one of the problems for us. Um, as, as Christians especially, we don't, we don't live inside of this deep, basic logic that is of the faith, that the earth is alive and communicative. It doesn't talk like we talk, but it's communicative. And unfortunately, we're inside a long legacy of missionaries and others who killed, who destroyed that deep sensibility in so many people because they saw it as primitive, naive, and in many cases, as I said, demonic. But it's crucial for us. Why? Because upon it, we build a sense of connectivity. And from a sense of connectivity, we build a sense of relationality. If we don't have a sense of connectivity, a sense that we are connected to place, then whatever vision of relationality we have will be hollow because it has no consequence for how we actually live in a place. And, you, and I want to clarify that you, mm -hmm. when you talk about place, you're not suggesting that you can only be from one place or be part of one place. Right. What I think you're saying is when we are together in this place, we need to be together. Right. That we are sharing this space. Right. It's, yeah. it's one of the common misunderstandings about what, what um, anthropologists call nomadic existence. Mm -hmm. Nomadic existence is not existence in which you're not connected to the earth. It's existence where you're even more connected to the earth. That is, people follow the patterns of the land. They follow the animals. They go where the food is. And the point that we want to hold on to is that wherever we go, we can live in many places and many of us do. The point is that wherever we live, we connect to the place. We don't live in places as though all places are inconsequential and every place is the same. Now, of course, many of us do because that's how we've been shaped in this world. But we've hollowed out our lives in such profound ways when we when we live that way. 
Willie, thank you for sharing this space with us today. Thank you all for coming. Willie will be in the West Lobby to meet you.